Hello and welcome to my presentation on Can engineering, Online Engineering Lectures Be Fun? A Perspective on Developing Educational Videos. I will be presenting. I'm Professor Catherine Kim. I'm an Associate Professor at National Taiwan University and I will be sharing my perspective on how I do my teaching. Let's get started. So most people, most institutions, universities, use a traditional learning format, especially in engineering. So we have a student sits passively in the class. Sometimes they are active and they will ask questions, interact. But the main purpose of the lecture is for the professor to profess everything that they know uh, to an audience. And um, then after that, you go home and you apply the concepts in homework. And in engineering, that homework is typically problem solving problems. So that works for a number of people and that's great for them, but actually it doesn't always help everybody. A lot of students who may be struggling with getting the concepts um, have trouble mostly in implementing the homework. And at that time, there's no person to ask necessarily the professor or the TA. They have other ways of getting to the answers. But um, what if we flipped that? So this is the flipped learning approach. And the idea is that you have a pre-recorded lecture, especially since the lecture is kind of the same every year. Of course, it's adapted a little bit, but the same general content. So if you have that as a lecture, the student can watch that ahead of time. And then when you get to the classroom, you can do some sort of activity for engineering that's usually problem solving. And the professor or the, the teaching assistants can come around and help the students individually. Um, so I have chosen to do the flipped learning approach as much as possible. Um, but one of the challenges is that you have to make the lecture videos ahead of time or find lecture videos that you like that fit with your class. So let's talk about my specific approach. There are some variations of the flipped learning, but this is what I do. I have short videos that I record, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then after the students watch a set of those for each lecture, they will go to an online quiz, do that. It's just a comprehension quiz, pretty easy, but just make sure that they actually do watch the videos. And then if they have any questions, they can prepare that for the class. In the class, I do pretty much just check in with the students and I give them problems right away. And they'll work usually in small groups, either pairs or a larger group, depending on the, the setup. And then I and other teaching assistants will go around and check on the students and help them with the problems to figure out where they are in the progress. It, for as a, for a, a professor, it helps get right away if students are all having trouble on something or if actually I think they're going to have more trouble, but they do it really easily. I can see that right away um, as I'm going. Or if there's a clarification question, I can address that right away. So that's why I really like having this interaction with the students, I get to know them, and then I can get feedback from them more directly. Um, recently, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a very quick change to this virtual learning. And the challenge was that everything was virtual. So even though in my flipped learning approach, the lectures at a time would be essentially virtual, the actual learning in the classroom would, would be a little bit different. So that would also be, have to move online. But I think if you kind of blend these two together, you can still get really good benefits. And I'm gonna try to propose that it would be benefits for the student and also benefits for the professor. All right, so let's start with the, start from the students. From the student perspective, if you have these lecture videos that are made ahead of time, it allows the students to watch at their own pace. So if they are, you know, really easy, can go through it quickly, or if they actually want to like go back, they can, um, well, well, first they can watch it at their own pace, and then they can pause it, for example. And then if they don't understand something or they want to review, they can rewatch that same video. So it allows the students to have control of that 
that information, the lecture itself. The positive part for the instructor is that if you make a good video, then you can reuse that video. But you do have to make them so that you can build them into other uh, courses or your same course and future other courses as well. So um, it really should be a kind of a building block, almost like when we write a textbook, right? We're going to reference that material. It's the same thing, but just in video form. So I think it does have benefits, but it does take a little bit of uh, upfront work. So this was just from my um, feedback from my first course of uh, doing this in terms of compared to in-person lectures um, and other courses, how effective did you find the video lectures? And the students pretty much found them to be the same or actually more effective. So, um, and this was the um, students who weren't necessarily prepped on flip learning, I just kind of made them do it so they didn't necessarily choose to have a flipped learning class they didn't know that ahead of time when they started the class so in general it was a very positive uh, reaction from the students and you can see um, from the students responses of what kind of tools they used they were doing mostly pausing and rewinding and then reading the english subtitles i will note that these were non-native english students um, which is very 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 common so i think um, that is a very helpful thing is to have the English subtitles when it's available. So those are tools that allow students to have more flexibility. Uh, I also want to talk about the videos, um, the style. So I made two different types of videos. One was just the self-made videos and those were about um, 10 minutes long and took some time to prepare. Um, I also had some more professional ones, and so those were done in a studio, and they we had hired people to do the editing uh, and things like that. I wanted to see which one of these made a dip if they made a difference to the students, because the professional videos took um, actually quite a long time, about 12 plus hours to prepare just one 10 minute video, whereas the self-made ones still took some time. They took about four hours to prepare, shoot, edit, subtitle, review. I did all of this myself. I did not hire any students for the self-made ones to help me with them. For the professional ones, we did have professional um, people helping with the editing and the shooting, but the actual content, everything I had to make myself. The student feedback generally was that professional video looked pretty nice, but that, that's, they don't really benefit, get a higher benefit than the self-made ones. The student feedback for the self-made ones were that it was actually more natural and the content uh, had the same level of understandability. So you don't necessarily need a professional video if you're making these yourself, but you do need to be have a strategic approach to making the videos. So let's talk about that. So say you're convinced I want to make some educational videos or I want to convince my professor to do it. How would you do this? Okay, so this is my approach. Rather than recording your lecture in a class, which you can do if for some reason you need to be in the classroom like to lecture, you can also record it live. Um, but my approach is to kind of make it like a, a YouTube video. So like you are just talking to the camera, which is the student or the learner. And my idea or my approach is to say they should be short because students will sometimes watch up to 20 minutes videos, but generally you want to have one concept and you want to stick to that one concept. So that can be anywhere from five to 15 minutes, sometimes up to 20, but you don't want to have like a long series of them all in one. It's better to cut it up into individual videos. And the reason is that you can use them in multiple courses. So rather than, so for example, I have introduction to control, rather than making a long video that has five different concepts in it, I choose to cut them up and for example, focus on linear, nonlinear functions. I could use that in control, but I could also use that in power electronics when we're talking about modeling there. So if I make a generic video that covers a topic, then I can um, use them in both courses 
and I've essentially I've already done the work up front and I can continue to use that video so that's my recommendation for anyone who wants to make those types of videos um, the typical format that I have is the title in the um, title and then which you don't actually need to have if you're a professor I try to do an introduction of what we're going to cover in the video and then um, the actual technical content and then a summary at the end and the summary actually at the end is also very important because um, kind of if you're going through a textbook you kind of look for like the key like what do I need to take away if you have that last screen of your video as kind of that takeaway with a good summary on it the students can use that as um, like, oh, what was in this video? So I even use it. I just jump to the end of my video and look at the final screen and see what content I actually covered. So that is how I do it personally. Um, another thing we asked about, like, can it be fun? I think it can be. You kind of have to have some different ideas about how to approach it. Actually, to have a little bit of fun with it, you may know my wonderful friend Valerie here. Most professors will not have a alien friend to help them teach or a stuffed electron or various other visual aids. But actually, I found that these kinds of demos or um, characters will help students remember better. And if you want them to remember your topic, you have to make it a little bit out of the ordinary in order for them to remember it. So. Um, I try to make it more memorable and fun with really bad acting and skits, um, but also you have to make it your own. So my general approach of the video is to have one concept, concept per video, keep it smaller. If you're going to derive anything, try to do it by hand rather than uh, death by PowerPoint because um, just like the writing it out, you can, if you're really worried about it taking too long, you can actually speed up the video, but just like that, writing it out, that's kind of how much time it takes for someone to process it, especially someone learning it the first time. So I, that's why I actually like to write out on a whiteboard. Um, between the visuals and the audio, the audio is actually more important. Um, most people will, uh, you may have noticed this when you watch videos, if it has bad audio or something is weird with the audio, you tend to not want to watch it. So um, it's important to be able to remove background noise if you can. Sometimes it's not possible. Um, but have a clear audio is more important than the video um, quality itself. As long as they can read what you need to write, um, that's good enough. You can use subtitles, um, which is recommended for non-native English speakers and for native English speakers, actually. It doesn't hurt. Um, and the good thing about a video is that you can also go back and if you did something, you said something wrong, I do all the time. Actually, most professors do slip up a little bit. So you can actually go back and like write what should have been done. So even if you don't have the most perfect take, you can still make it workable and make sure people don't get confused by a slip up in what you said. The other thing which has been hard for me is don't be a perfectionist. It's not worth the time. Just try to do it in as few takes as possible. Get it out there. As long as the content is there, the students can understand it. It's good enough. What do you need for recording equipment? Well, you need a camera. A tripod or at least a sturdy uh, camera setup is good. And a microphone is key. Uh, my original videos, I was just using the microphone on my uh, camera and that was not good enough. Then I got just like a wire mic, as you can see in the picture here, and now I have some wireless microphone setups. You can get them for a fairly, uh, fairly affordable price and you just need those basic things. Optional things are like a higher quality camera, better lights, wireless microphone, a camera setup for like documents, a green screen like I'm using now. Um, but you don't need to have all of those things. All right, so this is the end here. I will take whatever questions you guys have. Um, but to conclude, flipped learning is something that I really like to do because it allows me to interact with my students better and get feedback from them 
without them necessarily speaking up. So even the um, students who might be a little bit more passive or a little bit tentative to speak up, I can check in on their progress and make sure that everyone is following the course. Also, when they work in groups, sometimes the other students will actually help more because they've had the same background in their courses than me, for example, who's coming in from a different perspective. So sometimes the groups can actually help a lot, the student even more in learning the concepts and really getting them. For developing videos, if you decide you want to do them, um, just make them by yourself. It's not that different to the student and make sure you have a good audio and just acceptable video. Your phone is probably all you need for that. So with that, I will end and um, thank you very much for your attention.